So, hello. I've just learned that even at tech conferences, it's not super appreciated chain, uh, sending a weird slide format. Um, so this is what you're seeing now is Google Slides. And I can run all of you Google geeks. It actually works. It's great. You should try it and get all the tech conferences in the world using it, because it's amazing. But I'm not here to talk about slide formats. I'm here to talk about how horrible it is to be a founder. And so I have a little survey here. How many here are founders? Good. So some people will feel some agony. How many here are investors? Because this, this is slightly for you. OK, OK, interesting. And the rest of you, they're here for like good shares and drinks? Or like what's the plan? Okay. You're sitting here at least. So the thing is, being a founder is pretty horrible. I've started two companies. And uh, one was exited for a $150 million exit. And that was, of course, in a very, very rocky ride, as everybody knows who tried to build a company. But the thing is, any company you're building independently or traction get, getting, it's horrible. And the thing is that founders, they're supposed to be visionaries. They're supposed to be inventors. They're supposed to be rebels. But they're also supposed to be leaders. And the thing is, those four words does not fit into one human body, which is not about to explode. So what I hopefully will feel, the, the feeling that I'm trying to convey to you during this talk is it's totally normal to feel like a psych case. Does any of the founders feel like a, like a psych already? Or you maybe you don't need it explained. OK, I'll, I'll try to explain it. So the thing is, I think the problem is that the problem of being an early stage founder especially, it's kind of like trying to explain a dream to somebody. It feels so clear, so vivid, so concrete. And then you explain it to somebody, and they just end up criticizing you. They end up saying, like, I don't understand. Where is it leading? How will you monetize it? Like, really, actually what you do? Isn't that what Sendesk is doing? And you just feel so frustrated, because you, it's so clear in your mind, but people People, people don't get it. And the weird thing is we require this of founders. We, the co-founders, we, the employees, and we, the investors. And I think that's a, that's a pretty unfair world to work in. And the thing is, if you finally are able to explain your dream, you're, some, you're able to explain your super ambitious idea, you kind of have two outcomes. Either you're way too early for the market, and you're a real lunatic, and you just have to wait for the market to develop. And everybody who is right now working in a lot of blockchain technologies or a lot of uh, like edgy stuff, it might be too early. And they're sort of just working and working on something that just should be done in three years. The other risk is that you're doing something which is exactly right on time. And if you're right on time, the problem is you're the cohort of whatever, personal savings fintech or whatever, real estate software, whatever. And the problem is then it's a rat race. It's you and there's three other players, and you all are scaling to be big and very, very quickly. And anybody, both those two experiences are pretty horrific and pretty traumatic in two different ways. So, so let, let me stop moaning now and, and sort of give you a couple of solutions. So the first thing I do recommend everybody is set your ambitions. Because a lot of times when I meet founders, they haven't actually figured out, are the, is their plan to build a huge, scalable startup which is like VC fundable, this is going to be $100 million annual recurring revenue kind of company, or are they actually looking to build a lifestyle business? And the keywords, such keywords as in cash flow positive and stuff like that. And these are two completely different kind of businesses. If you're trying to build anything where the word cash flow positive is in it, it's not a VC case. If you're trying to build something extremely scalable, you have to be crazy ambitious, and you have to show how this is going to be a $100 million revenue company. And the thing is, what I think is so important is, is a lot of founders, they're not honest about this to themselves. And I think it's super important to understand life is a single player game. For those of you who are not founders and anything, it just, it's the same thing for you. We can't run leaderboards. We have to start running dashboards. Run a personal competition against yourself. And don't, like, don't care if everybody else right now is in startup land and it's super cool and TechCrunch is right about them and you have an agency and you love having an agency. Then you should be happy about that. And if you have a startup and you're breaking net and you're commuting to San Francisco and your friend is having caparinas on the beach and super happy and can take vacation, that's his or her life. You have to decide what your ambition is, and that's super, super happy. And I would tell you the most common way I've seen founders be unhappy, and I've angel invested in 68 startups now, so I've seen, sadly, quite a lot of that, is when you're, the ambition you communicate and your own ambition are actually not the same. So make sure that the, the ambition you're talking about and your own ambition is the same ambition. 
because you're just lying to yourself. So that is my first recommendation. I think that's super important. The second one is that startups, they don't die because of lack of funding. That's the thing everybody's saying. Oh, we died because we ran out of money. That's not true. It's not true at all. Startups, they don't die because of lack of funding. They drown. They drown because they're spending their time the wrong way. They're spending their time on the most stupid things ever. And I think that, I think the important thing is when you have that ambition, break it down to say, what are the goals we need to do this year? What does that mean for this half year? What does that mean for this month? What does that mean for these weeks? And then you have an extreme sense of urgency to do those things, and for fuck's sake, only those things. Don't talk to your angel investors and brag about your new logo type. Don't talk about your thinking about changing your name. Don't discuss the office furniture. Focus on getting users to use your product or whatever you're trying to do. Don't focus on all those other things that distract us. Make sure to set your ambitions and then have a crazy sense of urgency to do those things. And that, that's, that's the thing is that most people just fail on that. The second thing about that, to get that kind of crazy urgency that needed, one thing that I always recommend people is ask people why you will fail. Like ask everybody, ask colleagues, ask peers, ask your brother, your mother, your sister, whoever. Just ask them, why do you think we will fail? Ask investors, why do you think we will fail? And most founders, they don't want to ask this question. And if you get the answer, you're going to be pissed off. The way you should do this, if I will tell you, I don't think you can monetize, or I don't think you can get more than 100 users, or whatever this shithead will tell you, use this because from the outside, this is their fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And this is great because now you have a checklist of things you need to prioritize. And maybe you, if, if their guess is, I don't think you can get to $100 million annual recurring revenue, well, I guess you can't prove it to them, right? Not quickly at least, but you can prove it by proxy. You can show similar companies in similar sectors or whatever that have reached that kind of revenue. Because all the things people are telling you, all the fear, uncertainty, doubts, all the FUDs, they're great fuel for your checklist because they will give you the sense of urgency to put in the right direction and stop focusing on the wrong things. The, thing is the, la the, the, the third thing is that a lot of founders are very lonely and not because we're kind of introverts, not, not at all, um, but because being a founder is tricky. You're stuck really between the employees and the investors, or you're just, you feel like a lunatic because you're kind of on the edge of what's possible right now. And the thing also which is complicated is that yesterday you were programming, you were designing, you were writing blog posts, you were, you were a craftsperson. Suddenly the day after you walk into a room and your team expects you to be a planner, a leader, and a coach. And those are, those are very, very different things. And the crazy thing is most founders end up working double shifts. You work like nine to five or whatever, you work like this. And in the evening you come home and you plan and you do all the other things. And that's very common in the life of the founder because you have two roles. Unt until you're large enough, like when you're 15 people or something, you can, start, you can stop coding or whatever you're doing uh, because then you can actually have the time. You're, you're not going to be the best coder in the room. And this is tricky because the thing is you got to understand is the team is the product. And of course, not the first day when they're the two of you. But the more you grow, you have to be able to build your team members. And one of the things you easily can do this with is just sit down with your team members regularly, like once a month, and have, for example, a what will kill us meeting. Just have shitloads of beers. I guess I'm in Poland, so shitloads of vodka. Um, and just say, what will kill us? And you have a, like a good discussion, and you're not talking about solutions. Nobody's going to be constructive and say, no, I don't think that will kill us. No, you will be creatively discussion, ha creative discussion about what will fail. Because now you have a great cross list of things that actually, some of them are actually true. And that list is going to help you massively next week on where to focus and prioritize. And the, the last thing you should really do with your team, which most founders are really bad at because they're craftspeople and not leaders originally, is to make sure to talk to each team member of how they, they are feeling. How do you feel about stuff right now? What are you afraid of? Are you working too much, too little? And the, I always found that tricky when being a founder, and I, was, I started my first company when I was 21. I, I wasn't ready to like, lead other people. For God's sake, I couldn't lead myself. So the way I figured it out is what we did is that we just had dinners. So we just sat down on a dinner, and we just round the table, passed something around like a baton, and it was like, so how do you feel? You talk about how you feel. 
Nobody's interrupting you. Everybody's asking, oh, why do you feel like that? In front of the whole group. You're just four people in the beginning. It doesn't really matter. And then you grow the team. And until you're like eight people, you can still do this like round robbing, peer coaching kind of thing. And you as a leader, you can sort of learn how to do this on your own over time. And yes, I'll tell you, I know most of the tech start ecosystem are guys. And guys, we just hate looking each other in the eyes. That's why golf and sauna is super super for guys, because you don't have to look in each other's eyes. You can sit next to each other. But the thing is, you have to do this. Just sit next to each other and have this dinner, for God's sake. Again, vodka will help. The, thing is that the, the other thing is that most people start seeing their investors as their bosses. The thing is, investors are like parents of teenagers. They're completely clueless. They really try to like, have this aura of know-it-all, but like, they knew it all, right? Like, they, they used to know everything. That's why they became investors. But they don't know what you're really doing. Like, how many here have, have been teenagers? Okay, some, some have been teenagers. Okay so, like, okay, so some have been teenagers. Some has missed that phase. The thing is, when you're a teenager, is like you really feel that your parents don't get shit. And they don't. But they've been there. That's exactly what investors are. They don't get shit, but they really want you to succeed. And they really want you well. So make sure you're transparent and make sure to see them as your part-time kind of distracted colleagues and make sure to hel help them to help you. Most founders, they end up calling their investors last day when everything has gone to shit and they say, the thing is, the, um, it, we didn't sign the big deal, so we need to do a bridge round. Uh, could we figure this out pretty quickly because we're running out of cash at the end of the month? To me, that kind of sounds like that teenager call you did the time you were trapped in France and realized you didn't have money to the plane back home. And the thing is, your parents, yes, they bailed you out. Your investors might not. But the thing is, if you tell your investors well ahead of time, they will bail you out again and again and again until you actually suck at it and they will not bail you out. So make sure to keep your investors on board and be transparent with them. I cannot emphasize that enough. They're not your bosses. There are only four ways you can fail. Like most people think failure means lack of traction. Lack of traction is not failure. It's the status quo. It's like the default of startups. Like most startups don't get traction. Because otherwise we would have, uh, I mean, most investors wouldn't be investors. It's like one out of 10 even gets further than their seed round. People who raise a million dollars, one out of 10 raises an A round. So like it's not going to happen. It, it's, it's hard. Failure is something completely different. And these are the four things you can fail on you can end up in personal economic failure. I've seen that again and again with founders. In personal debt. That's just stupid. Like, I I've seen founders have shitty low salaries. Yes, that's totally cool. But like, don't work with a mob. Don't sell your house. Don't use money you don't have. Work with shitty low salaries, work hard, do whatever you want. But like, don't get into debt that you cannot get out of. The second one is health bankruptcy. So mental, physical, or rel relationally broke. I meet a lot of founders that after three or four years on the other side, yeah, we raised whatever, well, well we raised five million dollars from Sequoia, la 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 la. Five years later you meet them, and they look like a complete ghost. And you ask them, like, when was the last time you had a real meal? I'm like, I drink Soylent all the time, why my desk? Okay, when was the last time you saw sun? Sun? Yeah, I have this thing on my screen to make sure my screen is the color so that I don't get tired. Yeah, 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 I mean like the thing outside. When was the last time you kind of moved your body physically? Oh, yeah, yeah I, I, I play computer games sometimes to fall asleep because my brain can't stop. Okay, okay. Don't get there. What I did, and I can really recommend it, I booked in my calendar. Like book, like Tuesday morning, go for a walk. I had Wednesday evenings, I had eat dinner with a friend. And because of the achiever I was, every Monday afternoon, evening, I realized, God damn fuck, I haven't booked who I'm having dinner with on Wednesday night. And I can't unbook it, so now I have to nail it. I have to find the best dinner. And yes, I spent like 10 minutes on pinging everybody new. Dinner on Wednesday, no dinner on Wednesday, no dinner on Wednesday, dinner on Wednesday. Yes, yes, nailed. I'll send you the invite. And we had a dinner on Wednesday. And it was great. And my rule for myself was I will not have dinner with my colleagues on Wednesdays because that's cheating. And I only did that a couple of times. And then the, the third way you can fail is bitterness. And this is super common in Europe because we are not trying hard enough. We see that American competitor who raised a $5 million round, and the yip yap we do is that, oh, their burn rate is 10 times ours. Or like, you know, you know how quickly they burn out of cash? They pivoted three times already. It's like, yeah, but stop bitching about it. 
like we just, we have to stop being bitter. We just increase our ambitions, burn the company, kill it, do the next one. That's the way we build startups. And the f because the worst thing you can end up being is becoming a zombie startup. The, star the startup that survives because you're cut cutting your burn rate. Yeah, yeah, sure. We only had three months previously, but now we have six because we fired all the sales staff. Okay? And three, three months later, it's like, okay, so we have three months to go. No, 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 we increased. We, increased. we have six months now. How? We hired, fired half of the engineering team. Yeah, okay, you're going to starve yourself to survival. This sounds really smart. That's, that's the way we Europeans do it. We're like, we're lean. That's not a smart idea. It's better to try with ambition and do, do another startup. Don't become a zombie. And then the fourth way is becoming an asshole. And you've seen that too, right? You've seen the people who succeeded, who end, around, end up, not, they can't even live in Europe because people here don't have ambitions. They have to live in Palo Alto where the real people live. Don't become that person. Um, and the thing is, I'd really like to end, and I'm not a pro-American person, I can really tell you, uh, but I'm going to end with something which I think is very, very rare, but I really want you to listen to this one, because this is a, a speech written by Theodore Roosevelt, and I actually think it's really good. And I'm going to do something, I'm going to read this verbatim. And I want you to follow, because this is something I wish I had wrote. And I guess most, I hope, meal people. So this is what he wrote. It's called The Man in the Arena. He said, he wrote, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who actually is in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself to a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumphs of high achievement? And who at worst, if he fails, at least failed while daring greatly, so that in his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat, also known as investors. He didn't write that last part. I added that. So stop bitching about other people's startups and build your own amazing startups. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Are there, are there any questions for our speaker? Right. That was, it was yeah. everything needed. Okay. Um, you said that founder, after some time, uh, uh, can st stop coding and on become only a founder. Uh, is it needed? Does he have to do it? Or he can still coding? I, th I think that, so I, I mean, looking at most of the startups I know that have really succeeded, it's that they start as, they start as developers. Honestly, I personally really like developer-led founders. I really like developer-led startups. But what I've seen again and again is that year after year, what happens is that the, if you ask the founder, are you still coding, he or she says, well, I code, but none of the code is committed. Like, the engineering manager doesn't allow my code to run in production anymore. That, I think, is the common thing that happens after three or four years. You write a lot of prototypes, you write a lot of concepts, but the thing is, you don't have like eight hours of straight full attention anymore. And I think if you do, that means you're not the founding CEO anymore. You're, you're the CTO or whatever, but usually that's not even true because usually you need to lead the team. So, but, but what I've seen again and again is like, I have, I have invested in a lot of startups where like the, the founding CEO who is a developer said, I'm always gonna be coding. And then three years down the line, like you, you hear him or her saying, oh shit, just yet another goddamn front end framework that the kiddies in the room want to use. Can't we use React? React was good in my day. And there's a new thing. And you just start feeling old because you can't spend the 10 hours needed to actually keep up with everything. And, and all the new people can. And I think that's completely natural. And I say, also think that over time you become, first you, you're a developer, and then after time you become an architect. So you spend a lot more like planning what other people should build. And then I see a lot of founders becoming like a prototype or a conceptor. 
So like you in the evening build something, it kind of works, but it kind of duct taped together. And then you show it for somebody in the team. And they're like, yeah, we can build that. And we can build it for real. But it's going to take a bit more time than your evening. And as a founder, it's hard for us to like, this, this already works. Hey, I built it yesterday in two evenings. Yeah, yeah, but it's, like, it's never going to run with 200 concurrent users, but sure. Uh, and I think that's the, the journey I see again and again. So sadly, yes, I think we have to pass the baton. But, but it's, it's going to come. I see it very natural. Um, most of the time, I see the problem is that people don't think about the team because they're a solo player. So you think about yourself and how you optimize it. And you just expect everybody else to do. And I think then we're not using the team's full potential. The, the trick I would recommend is book an hour in your calendar that says talk to the rest of the team. That's what I did in the beginning. Any more uh, questions? All right. It was complete info. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very much.